Welcome to the workshop, everyone. Hope you're having a great day. Today, we're going to discuss three separate things. We're going to begin with talking about my new height modules I just made. Secondly, in the video, I want to talk about DFM. It's everywhere around you. You might even hold it in your hand. It's not dangerous, so you don't have to worry. And I'm going to tell you all I know about it. To finish up today, I want to talk about a bug I found today in Fusion 360. So in yesterday's video, I almost fixed the marble divider flushness perfectly. As you can see, there was one single channel left where one marble was sticking. Up. And I didn't have the correct height module to fix that. That last channel that didn't work yesterday was using this, the 12 module. This module comes from the first batch. I later made a big second batch here and today I made these. My hope is that one of these four will replace the 12 module and everything will work. So let's first see how high the marble was in the module we used yesterday. This one is 12.0, this one is 12.5, so a longer path. I hope the marble is lower. Hmm, <laughs> not a lot. Let's try 30. Uh, if you look very carefully, you see that the marbles are disappearing, like a nice moon face feeling, no? I am a little worried that I didn't went low enough though. So this module was the partner module. Oh, that's lowest. Okay. So what I'll do is that I use these two, the lowest ones, and then I think I'm gonna use this one in the other slot and this one in the partner slot. So super quick recap here. If you look at the marbles up here on the machine, they go down and come out down here. But if you look into the middle of the machine, you can see my hand there and how I'm Pushing this module in, it should slap, yeah, like that. So this module intercepts the marble path and changes the marble path's total length. So I can accurately control the height of the top marble. So let's put the 40 module in, come sa, and then the latch to lock them in place. So now we need to fill the empty marble pipes with marbles. A moment of truth for the new module. Here's the six channels. Let's see what happens. Good. Low. No, I see. I have modules that are just higher. I'm going to change around and test again. I've changed the modules. Let's try again. That's good. Oh, that looks okay. Are we going to make it five, four of five, four of six? Okay. <laughs> if this marble, no, we have one more. Nice. If this marble passes all these channels, I finally made it. Num, 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 num. <laughs> Let's check if this is repeatable. Oh, did you see that? <laughs> mm, num, 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 num. Mission accomplished on the marble divider. This system that I've designed is actually great. If you've been with me from the start, if you remember the 3D prints with different heights inside the marble divider, that was the solution we had before, which was not adjustable. It was just causing so much issue and I was constantly scared of the marbles losing height and stuff. With this system, if I discover that I want one marble a little bit higher, I just push another module in. Great. D F 
Um, what is it? Why haven't I heard about it before? Is it dangerous? I'm gonna tell you right now. <laughs> this is the kind of thing, once you've seen, you can't unsee. So red pill or blue pill, do you want to know? Or do you need to click away now to live free in your life, not knowing that there's a whole DFM system flowing through all of our lives? <laughs> The sign for manufacturing or DFM is a general engineering practice of designing products in such a way that they are easy to manufacture. DFM describes the process of designing or engineering a product in order to facilitate the manufacturing process in order to reduce its manufacturing costs. DFM will allow potential problems to be fixed in the design phase, which is the least expensive place to address them. If you look around you in your room, everything you see around you has been designed. We kind of know that, we don't think about it all the time, but someone has designed everything you see. If you're not in the forest, then evolution is the designer. That's a little bit different. What I don't think we think about is that everything you see has also been designed for manufacturing most often. I'm going to give you two real world examples. So on these shelves here, can you see anything that has been designed for manufacturing? I'm of course talking about the shelves themselves. Swedish furniture maker IKEA has taken this design for manufacturing to the extremes. They even design for transportation and logistics to make all their furniture like in flat packages. So these shelves are made by bent galvanized steel only. The other day I noticed how they hidden the screw only by bending this over. So only by simple bends they create these shelves. So this bent metal is hiding the screw coming in from the backside. Genius. So this edge here is very nice. That's also a bent edge. If you look in here. So someone somewhere have said, okay, we're gonna bend galvanized steel, now make a shelf with that manufacturing method only. This is pretty impressive. We don't have to mention the fact that these shelves hardly can stand by themselves. <laughs> they are so rickety rackety. Even though a visit to IKEA can be highly polarizing, I think my next example of DFM is even more polarizing. I'm talking of course about Tesla's Cybertruck. What has amazed me in the debate about the Cybertruck's design is how impossible it seems for people to understand that it's designed for manufacturing, okay? <laughs> the Cybertruck has an exoskeleton of like three millimeter thick bent stainless steel. All the polygonal shapes comes from how the truck is going to be manufactured. I went through such a roller coaster reaction to when I saw the design rolling in the presentation. When it came in, I said loud out in the room, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and it took me exactly 24 hours for me to totally flip into absolutely loving it. <laughs> it was just so different and so many seem to believe that it looks like that to be provocative or to be futuristic. And part of it is of course that it's inspired by a science fiction film, but most of it is DFM. 25% of a car factory is the paint shop. The Cybertruck has no paint. The galvanized IKEA shelf downstairs has no paint. My plywood has no paint. If I had to lacquer all these parts, uh, World Tour 2060. <laughs> so when you look closer at the Cybertruck, to me it stands out as a complete burst of inspiration. The looks are crazy amazing, the functionality is amazing, and the cost of producing it is lower than everything else. This is the kind of magic trick that DFM can do. So whenever I get interested in a debate about anything, I try to listen to both sides. So I've been watching YouTube videos from people who hate the Cybertruck and from people who loves it. And then I can kind of make up my mind hearing both arguments and kind of weigh them against each other. During my Cybertruck meanderings, I came across this video that I thought was especially interesting. It's from a world-renowned car designer, Frank Stevenson, and the title is The Cybertruck Review That Took Me A Year To Make. And what's interesting with this video is not what's in the video, it's what isn't in the video. I only watched this once for a long time ago. I don't want to put words in his mouth if I'm wrong with this, but it's clear that he likes softer shapes. Not once in the whole video of this review that took a year to make is the design for manufacturing aspect mentioned. It's so fascinating 
that a world-renowned car designer makes a 10-minute review about the Cybertruck design and for some reason omits to mention why it looks like it does. And I'm just very curious if it was deliberately omitted and just overseen. And perhaps it can even be perhaps just overseen. So you have this thing that goes viral on the internet and so much of the discussion proves that people don't know what they're looking at. <laughs> so when you don't apply a DFM perspective on a design discussion about the Cybertruck, you're really actually not talking about the Cybertruck. You're talking about straight shape versus round shapes, which ones you think is most beautiful. If you go through the comments under the video, you will see the two camps. You will have camp, I think round shapes are more beautiful and more friendly and cozier and warmer to humans. And camp, this is a designer versus engineer battle. And in the Cybertruck, they actually combined uh, manufacturing and design in a genius way. The DFM camp, if you would say. And in the review, there's a kind of a political overlay about what kind of future we want. And the Cybertruck is being made into this harsh symbol with straight, uh, unempathetic lines, which is not soft and round to us humans. <laughs> so even in the really big picture, what kind of world we want to live in, we see the Cybertruck and we see two different things. I see an amazing future and a lot of other people see this as some kind of dystopian threat. In yesterday's video when I was putting all this together, you saw me childishly throwing the file into the workbench. I really had pain in my arms from doing the post-processing of this and putting all these together. So I decided to see if I could use my recent DFM inspiration to redesign this little part to make it easier to put together. And that's what I've been doing today. Here's the old version and here's the new DFM version. So let's play a game. How many changes do you think I made from the version yesterday to the version today? So first of all, I decided to go for a double-sided machining. So I machined this piece from two sides. I flipped it over on the CNC machine. So that made it possible to move the manual operations into the CNC machine and save time. So these chamfers was done on the CNC instead of the disc sander. So I had this 90 degree here. And on the new one, I made that with a cutout on the CNC machine instead. So I didn't have to file there. I added the numbers on the outside, so I don't have to keep track or write the numbers on the inside. So that's one change. On the second iteration, I used a 2 millimeter engraving tool for these numbers. They look great. But for this, I just used the ball end tool that I use for everything. So I skipped a tool change there. I moved these two holes further in to have room for this cutout. So moving the holes to... On the outside, I countersunk these with the CNC machine, but not with a countersink tool, the same tool that I used for everything else. I rounded the corners with a very small radius. It's like one or two millimeter. There, there, there. Having a little radius in the corners prevents wood chips and prevents sanding. So that's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight changes. All in all, on this little part, 27 changes. <laughs> that's pretty cool. If you're curious about DFM and want to hear from someone who actually knows something about it, Sandy Monroe from the Monroe Live YouTube channel. It's a gold mine of easily accessible information. So then I took my new design to the test and I challenged myself to make these on the CNC machine as fast as I could. So I put the clock there so you could see, and all this is in real time. I really pushed the CNC machine super hard with fast feed rates and cutting times. Here you can see me flipping the part over to start to machine the other side. And I think here I made the largest mistake in the tool path. The beginning of the marble path is not cut fast, but the end is cut really fast. I stopped using the parallel tool path and got a better one that's following the marble lane. As you can see, it goes really fast and then it's just plowing through everything. So. So it took actually 30 minutes for the CNC machine to machine these eight pieces. And then I put them together and all in all, from plywood to finished parts, it took 45 minutes. I'm pretty sure this is five or 10 times faster than what I did it before. So I'm very happy for this. So this morning I made a really, really, really nice Fusion 360 design that lets me parametrically produce these modules in any value I want. The Module Machine X. I think this is the best CAD file I've ever made. This distance right here 
is determining the value of the marble path. So let me do something more viewable, 10. Do you see how the path got tighter? Six. Now the path is almost straight. And you can also see that the part, the mirrored part next to it is also changing. So let's do 15. The marbles have a longer way to go, see? But I'm not entering these values. I just put module one. So when I want to go in here and make four new modules, I just go on uh, modify, change parameters. I just enter my values here. So I want the first one to be 11. That will change the first pair. This one will change the second one. I want this to be six. I want the next one to be 14.5, hardly any change. And I want the last one to be 17, quite a lot. Boom, all the values are in. How cool is that? <laughs> I do have to manually fill in the numbers, but only for one at a time. This engraving is automatic and you can see when we're out here, the mirrored part is already engraved with the mirror 13. So the module machine X, when I need a new module, I can just go in here, type in the values, and then immediately head over to the manufacturing workspace. And I discovered a bug here today. I spent five hours on this today. When I wanted to change from design to manufacturing workspace, the program crashed all the time. If your Fusion 360 is crashing when you go to manufacture, go into design, roll back the timeline till, till the beginning, go over to manufacture, delete the manufacturing model. That's the trick. These are the tool paths and I'm doing double-sided machining and I really liked this one. It just goes on the edges because this is what I had to sand on the disk sander manually before. So I used a sketch to make the parallel just on the edges like that very efficient. And if we go to the second setup, we flip the stock around like this. And then I flip the plywood on the CNC machine. I spent quite a lot of time on this toolpath. And this was also the toolpath that I think I can optimize even more. But these blue lines that are following the marble path is doing a really efficient job. It's a fun problem solving thing, actually, I love it. Okay, I wanna show you one more thing. I'm building it up with the sketches and the planes first. So if you see the timeline, that was something I learned from the MMX CAD team. So thanks everyone from live stream we did on Twitch. So instead of projecting the sketches on bodies, as I always did before, I tried to project the sketches on sketches or on construction planes. So this is kind of the skeleton of the whole design. And as you can see here, there's no bodies. It's just construction things, sketch lines and construction planes. First, now I do an extrusion feature. Um, then I do some more and then I parallel pattern that into four parts. Then I do the sweeps, which is the marble paths themselves. And when all these bodies are done, I mirror them. So they have the mirrored partners. That's the module machine X. It has been so fun for two weeks now sharing the day-to-day -day progress. So happy that you're all enjoying this. Me and Hannes are having a lot of fun. Next week we will continue and I'm going to try to push the marble machine X as hard as I can ever because I really want to finish this project. It's, it's, it's ready for, to cross this finishing line now. I have to, <laughs> I must, please. <laughs> Y'all are awesome. Have a wonderful week and see you on Monday.